In this video, I will talk about multiple regression model in Stata. Before you watch this video, please make sure that you have watched my other video called multiple regression model. So let's get started. I have opened up the program here and I have executed it by just uh, running uh, the do command. And um, what we're going to learn today is the multiple regression model. I will talk about what it is. Then I will talk about partialing out, the goodness of fit, including R squared and adjusted R squared, perfect collinearity, multicollinearity using the variance inflation factors, omitted variable bias, variance in specified models, and heteroscedasticity and homoscedasticity. For this, you will need the following four data files. Please download them and tell Stata where these data files are located. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. The first analysis that we're going to do is multiple regression model. And we would be reading data on uh, wages, uh, education, experience, in ten and tenure. So uh, we will be using this data set, uh, listing, describing, and summarizing the data. So this is how the data looks like. Uh, wage would be our dependent variable, education, experience, and tenure would be our independent variables. And here you will find more information on how the variables are defined as well as summary statistics. So the first regression that we're going to run is a simple regression where we have a wage is our dependent variable, education is our independent variables. And then we would run multiple regressions with more than one independent variable. So wage would be the dependent variable, education and experience would be our independent variables. And here we're going to be adding uh, tenure as well, how many years a person has been in the company. So once we execute these uh, regressions, uh, this will be the output that you get from the simple regression. Wage is the dependent variable, education is the independent variable. And the coefficient that we're interested in is right here. This is the coefficient on education and it's 0.54. The way you would interpret it is that if education increases by one year, then wages would increase by 54 cents. So when we have a multiple regression adding another variable of experience, uh, we would also have this variable listed here. Now we see that this coefficient would be a little bit different uh, in the multiple regression. And finally, here's the regression incorporating all three independent variables. And uh, these are the coefficients for them. So the coefficient under education shows that for one additional year in education, we have a 59 cent increase in uh, wages. So let's uh, do a little bit more analysis with these regressions here. Uh, one way to display the coefficients and to store them in the system is uh, just using underscore B and then in parentheses we have education. This means, remember, this is the coefficient on education. B is the coefficient on education. So if we're displaying it, we see that this number here is exactly this, this number here. If we are displaying the coefficient on experience, this coefficient, that's exactly that coefficient and so forth. So now we can store these and later on we will see how we, we are going to use these coefficients in the program. We can calculate uh, predicted values and residuals. This is the same as simple regression. So we can use the command predict. We are giving it a name of wage hat. Wage hat comma xb is calling the predicted values. And if we use predict, we're giving it the name u hat, uh, comma residual is storing the residuals. Now, if you can see what these are using the data editor, but uh, we can summarize them here uh, by summarizing the dependent variable wage, wage hat, our predicted value, and u hat, the residual. Let's see what these summary statistics are saying. So our summary statistics are showing that 
the u hat, the mean for u hat is close to zero. And this is one of the properties of the simple regression uh, and, and the multiple regression. And uh, we can also see that the wage, the mean of wage and the mean of wage hat, the predicted values have the same mean. So the mean of the actual value is the mean of the predicted value. So why is that? Well, it's because of the equation of wage equals wage hat plus u hat. So basically the actual value is equal to the predicted values plus the residual. Uh, if the mean for this residual is zero, this is why we have the mean for the wage equals the mean for the uh, wage hat. That's what we have shown here. So next, next, let's consider what we call partialing out. So for partialing out, um, that shows the coefficient beta 1 are the same in the first and the last regression. So it shows an alternative way of calculating these coefficients. So let's read the same data uh, for wages. And here's the procedure that we can use for partialing out. We can run the regular regression that we've done before, reg, wage, and then these are our independent variables. And these are going to be the coefficients that we have on it. So um, the beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 would be the parameters that would be estimated as coefficients. So instead of that, what we can do, um, we can calculate this beta 1 in an alternative way. To do so, we first run a regression of education on experience and tenure. So we run the independent variable being a dependent variable this time on the other independent variables. So if we do reg of education, experience, and tenure, uh, this is what we will see here for this regression. So now that this regression is run, uh, we can predict the residual from this regression. So this E here is the new error term and the residual from this regression would be E hat. So we can uh, estimate, we can predict the residual E hat comma residual. So we're getting the residual from this regression. And now for the new regression, we can regress wage on E hat. So uh, what we're doing here is we have the original dependent variable regressed on the residuals from the regression of the independent variable on all of the other independent variables. So this would create this equation of wage equals new intercept plus beta 1 times e hat. And if you look at actually these, this uh, regression that we estimate, this coefficient on e hat 0.59 is exactly the same coefficient as we had in the original regression here. Um, and the reason for that, uh, the reason why this partialing out works is because by calculating the residuals from this regression, we're basically looking at the variation in education that is not explained by these two variables because what is explained is part of the regression so what is not explained is part of the residual from this regression so if we put here the variation that is in x1 our education variable that is not explained by the other variables that is basically what this beta 1 hat coefficient is showing and this is why we also use uh, the term all else equal or all other factors are held fixed in a regression because we only consider the pure effect of one unit change in education on wages. Next, let's consider with goodness of fit measures. So this is how well the regression uh, fits. So we would be using R squared and adjusted R squared, and they would be showing the proportion of variation explained by regression. Using the same data set, we can run a simple regression with one uh, regressor, um, a way to display the R squared that is stored is we can use display E of R2. This is already pre-programmed in Stata and we can just call and see what this number is. 
or we can do display e of r2 underscore a that basically calls the adjusted r square so if we run the regression that's where um, the r squared and adjusted r squares are, are calculated so they're already given to us that the r square is 0 0.16 and the adjusted r square is also 0 0.16 if you're displaying e of r2 that's basically exactly the same number as this one and if you're displaying e of r2 underscore a uh, this is the displaying the adjusted r square well that number is exactly that number that that data calculates okay so moving on let's run a regression with two independent variables and then let's run a regression with all three of our independent variables so here's where we are running a regression with all three of our regressors and we're again displaying these values um, and and so how the question is how can we obtain these r squared and adjusted R square by calculating them ourselves. Yes, they're stored in the system, but we can calculate them ourselves. To do that, uh, we need to remember what the formula is to calculate the R squared manually. So let's look at this table called the ANOVA table. So what this table shows is the sum of squares for the model, which is also called the explained sum of squares, sum of squares for the residuals and sum of squares total. And these are the degrees of freedom on all of these um, uh, these different uh, variations. And so let's go ahead and calculate and store these. So we're generating what we call SSE equals E of M S S is the sum of squared explainer the model. State actually knows what these are by using this command. So this is our SSE or this value right here. SSR is called by using E of RSS, sum of squared residuals. And then SSD is the summation of these uh, SSE and SSR. So this is the sum of squares total. So what we are doing is we are recording uh, and generating new variables for the SSE, SSR, and SST. Then we need to uh, generate uh, degrees of freedom for these SSE, SSR, and SST. And the degrees of freedom are basically these numbers here. So if we start from the first one, uh, the, the degrees of freedom for the model is basically equals to K. This is the number of regressors. So we have three independent variables, education, experience, and tenure. This is why this number is a three. The last degree of freedom here is n minus 1, and this is the number of observations n, uh, which is 526 minus 1. This is why this number is here. And the degrees of freedom for SSR is equal to n minus k minus 1. So n is 526 minus three independent variables one, minus one, this is 522. So these numbers are already calculated and we are basically just, um, uh, just storing them for the degrees of freedom. So now what was the formula for the R squared? Well, R squared is equal SSE divided by SST. So we're generating a new uh, variable called R squared equal SSE divided by SST. That is the same as R squared equals one minus the SSR divided by SST because the sum of squared explained and the sum of squared residuals sum up to SST. The formula for the adjusted R square is the adjusted R square equals one minus the SSR divided by its degrees of freedom for SSR, and then divided by uh, SST divided by the degrees of freedom for SST. And so we can display the adjusted R squared. So after we calculate all of these things manually, notice that we will receive the same two numbers, uh, we will calculate the same two numbers that are given there in the output. And the, this is the R squared that's given in the output, and this is the adjusted R squared. So what we've done here is we calculated this um, ourselves. 
So now let's continue on with the CEO uh, salary example. So here we would be reading in the uh, data that we have on CEO salary. And so we will keep the salary, the log of salary, the return on equity for the company, and then sales and log of sales. So let's suppose now that we want to use R-square, an adjusted R-square, to select the best um, model, the one that fits the best. So we can run four combinations of models. Uh, the first one would be the linear form. So here salary and sales are ent entering linearly. Here is the linear log form where salary is linear but sales is in log. Here's the log linear where the salary is in logs but the sales is not and the log log where both of them have logs. So we can run these four different types of regressions and compare the R squared and the adjusted R squares. So let's notice what's happening with these two, uh, with these two regressions. So the R square here is 0.02 and here is uh, 0.05, uh, the, the R square. So notice that the SST for both of these regressions is the same. Why? Because we have the same dependent variable, which is salary for both of them. So the total variation in salary is what the total variation is in salary. Uh, and it's the same for both models. Uh, and now um, we can see basically which of these variables sales or log of sales uh, helps um, uh, with the model fit better. And so if we compare these uh, R squared, uh, basically we will see that the, um, the R square here and the adjusted R squares uh, are higher for the model, for the linear log model. This means that uh, if we use the adjusted R square as a criteria to uh, select between models, then we should pick the linear log uh, regression over the linear form. Likewise, if we compare the two models of the log linear form and then the log log form, uh, what we're going to find here is that the total variation here has changed. Why? Because we have the dependent variable being log of salary instead of salary. So the total variation in logs is, is less. So now the question is, do we prefer the model that has sales or log of sales? Well, to do to figure this out, we look at the adjusted R square. Here's 0.12 and here's 0.27. So this one, this model has the adjusted, higher adjusted R squared, and that's why this model is the preferred one based on this criteria. And out of the four models that we estimated, although they do not have the same dependent variables, uh, this one here with 0.27 adjusted R square, that has the highest adjusted R square. And, that, and because this is the criteria, we would choose the log log model as the preferred model that has the highest adjusted R square. Next, let's talk about what is perfect collinearity and give an example of that. So we will return here to the wage example with the wage data. And let's run a model where we have a regression of wage, education, and female. Uh, so wage is the dependent variable, education and female is the independent variable. And so here we have a regression output. Um, so if we can interpret this coefficient, if uh, a person is female, they would get $2.27 uh, lower wage than males. So now what would happen if we try to uh, add another variable in the model that is male? Recall that male equals one minus female. Why? Because a person could be male or female. And um, that is an example of perfect collinearity uh, 
uh, because male is the exact linear function of female. So if we try to run a regression by just asking Stata, do a regression with wages, dependent variable, education, and here you put both uh, female and male as independent uh, variables, and we're trying to execute this code, what Stata would tell you is male is omitted because of collinearity. So Stata actually could not put uh, the variable male in the model because uh, it, it cannot be there. It cannot give you a coefficient because it's perfectly collinear with, with female. So in this case, Stata drops one variable and it would choose which one to, to drop. So you should never include variables in the model that are perfectly collinear of each other. Like if they sum up to 100%, if they're shares or, 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 or variables like that. Another way in which you can uh, estimate this model is by running a regression of wage on education male and female, but comma no constant, uh, here you will not have a constant for the model. So if you are looking at the results here, notice that this is the only regression that we saw so far that it does not have an intercept or a constant here as the last uh, last coefficient estimated here. So in this case, if we have no constant, we can estimate the coefficients on both male and female, but that's usually not a very common way to address uh, perfect collinearity. The best possible way is just drop one of the variables that is uh, making it for perfect collinearity. So likewise, if you have, say for example, uh, dummy variables for freshmen, sophomore, junior, and senior, you will need to skip one of these variables in the model, otherwise you will again have perfect collinearity and the model cannot be estimated. So now, the um, let's move to multicollinearity. Uh, and multicollinearity occurs where we have regressors being highly correlated with each other. So it's not a perfect collinearity and it's not a violation of our uh, assumptions for the linear regression, but uh, they still cause problems because they're very highly correlated with each other. So let's look at the new data set uh, for test scores. So I'm going to read in this data set here and I would only keep the variables that are of interest to me and I'll describe and summarize them. So here what we see is the dependent variable would be API uh, for 2000. So this is the test course for the student. And I will use three independent variables. Uh, college grad is whether, uh, you know, parents went to uh, college grad school. And then we have whether parents went to, um, to college and uh, then if they went to grad school and then the final one is the average uh, education for the parent. So these are the variables, they're summarized here and this is how the data looks like. So we have a test scores, college graduates, uh, graduate school completed and here we have the average education. So how we start the analysis, we can simply look at um, a correlation table. So to calculate a correlation between all the variables, we use the command correlate and then we put all of the variables in here. And this is a correlation table. And um, the correlation of a variable with itself is always a one, but we can see the parents average education and whether they completed graduates, the proportion that completed graduate school and, and college uh, degree is uh, these are very highly cor correlated with the average education for parents. Why? Because it's almost the same thing. The more people that completed uh, graduate school and college, their education would be uh, average education would be higher. So we have a very high correlation coefficient here. The coefficient, the correlation between graduate school and, and college graduate, um, it's, it's much lower. But these are very high correlation that may cause problems. So now let's run the formal uh, VIF test. And so what we'll do here is we will estimate the regression with the test score and the average education and 
uh, the graduate school and college graduate being independent variables. And then we will calculate the VIF, the variance inflation factor. And so here is how the regression coefficients look like. Uh, and then these are the standard errors and so forth. So if we calculate VIF, the variance inflation factor, we would see that for average education, this VIF factor is above 10. And our rule of thumb is that if a variable has over 10 a variance inflation factor, we would drop it from the model. So, okay. So here is the model where we drop this variable uh, from the model. So if you look at, uh, at this regression model, we no longer include the average education here. So that is the model that we estimate and we calculate VIF, the variance inflation factors afterward, and we see that they're all below 10. Or we can alternatively drop the other two variable and just leave the average education for the parents. If we do that, the variance inflation factor by definition uh, would be a one just because we have a simple regression. Uh, so uh, our conclusion here is that when we have a model that we estimate and these variables are highly collinear with each other in terms of having a very high VIF, variance inflation factor, we would definitely need to drop the variable that's causing that and that is very collinear with the other variables. Otherwise, what we are going to find is that sometimes these coefficients may actually even have opposite direction of what, uh, say, this coefficient um, here is even opposite in signs of the coefficients here. So um, again, we would get results that, uh, that may be misleading uh, if we have multicollinearity. Okay, so next let's talk about omitted variable bias. And omitted variable bias occurs when we have a variable that should be in the model, but it's omitted. And because of that, the coefficients on the variables that remain in the model are all biased. So for this example, we would use um, data on wage, education, and ability. And um, so this is the data that we have. I will describe, summarize, and list the first five observations. And that's what we have here. So we have wage, that's the hourly wage. Ability uh, is a, an ability measure and education is the highest grade completed. And these are some of the descriptive statistics for the data. So let's suppose that for, for any reason you don't have the variable ability in, in the data set or you forgot to include it. And even though it should be in the true population model, uh, now it is not included in the, um, in the regression model. So what would happen? Well, the answer is that the coefficients would be biased. So let's go slowly over that and see what happens. So the first model that we're going to be estimating is the true model that we have both education and ability as independent variables. And here wage would be equal to beta zero plus beta one times education plus beta two times ability plus u. That is the true population regression model. So we estimate the regression with wage, education and ability. And we could pick up uh, as this coefficient beta one on education and beta two on ability by just calling underscore b and this is the variable for which the coefficient refers to. So what I'm doing is I'm storing these coefficients here in, in, um, uh, in memory because I'm gonna use them later on. Here is, for the true model, this is what we see for the coefficient on, uh, on education. So the way we would interpret this coefficient is that if education increases by one year, then wages would increase by dollar uh, and dollar point fifteen, and this is how uh, 
you know, this coefficient, we know that it's an unbiased uh, measure of the population parameter. Okay, so now um, let's uh, suppose that we would not be including ability as an independent variable. So if we don't do that, actually there is still a relationship between ability and education. And we can discover this by doing regression of ability on education. And this is the model that we'll have ability equals delta zero, a new coefficient plus delta one new coefficient uh, times education plus uh, V. And so once we run this model, we can pick up this coefficient on education here. So if we run the regression, what we're storing is this coefficient here on education. So what we're going to see from this regression of ability, so our independent variable is now a dependent variable, and this is still our independent variable, uh, is that we have a positive and significant relationship between these two uh, independent variables. Okay, so now let's estimate a model that is now the misspecified model. So in this model where ability is the omitted variable, the coefficient on education would be biased. And we have derived that if we actually substitute this equation here, into this equation here, for, uh, so we substitute the ability here in the population uh, regression, and we open the parentheses, these are the coefficients that we're going to find. Well, so now what we have on coefficient for the coefficient of education is not only beta one, as it was the case before, that would be an unbiased coefficient, but we have this beta two times delta one. This basically is the bias on that coefficient if we omit the variable ability uh, from, from this regression. So if we run the regression of wage on education and we omit abil ability and it's not here, we can basically uh, look at this, um, this coefficient here on education. So this is 1.39. So if, if we actually estimate this model, we would wrongly state that if education increases by one year, then wage would increase by dollar and 39 cents. Notice that this coefficient here is higher than the 1.15 coefficient that we found above. Okay, so by how much is it higher? Well, uh, we can calculate the bias here. So we would know that the bias is the beta two times delta one. The bias basically is this amount right here. It's the what gets added onto this beta one coefficient here. And so we can calculate it and display the bias is exactly 24 cents. So we are basically attributing uh, what ability contributes to wage on education here because education is picking up that effect on ability as well. And if we calculate this again, this bias coefficient by using the original uh, beta one coefficient plus beta two times delta one, we can see that we are calculating this, this uh, coefficient precisely. So again, what happened here is that uh, because when education increases, ability would also increase. Now this coefficient here partly picks up the effect of ability on wages. And that's why that upward bias of 24 uh, cents, uh, we're wrongly attributing this to the effect of education on wage, but what it's actually in fact is the effect of Educate of ability on wage that is coming in through the relationship with the education. So here is another uh, example that we can do so that bias might not always be positive, it could be negative sometimes. So I will not spend as much time on this model, but here suppose that the true model we have uh, education and experience uh, as independent variables. So if we run just a regression of wage on education and we miss 
the variable experience, what would happen is again this coefficient would be biased. So in this case we have a 0.64 coefficient in the true model that is correctly specified and because experience and education are negatively related to each other, note that if we just estimate now the misspecified model here, uh, this will be the coefficient on education, it would be 0.54. So we actually would uh, would underestimate the effect of education on the wage because it has a negative ex through its negative um, relationship with the experience. Okay, so next let's talk about variance in misspecified models and this example would be the same as the omitted variable bias. So if we have the true model includes education and ability, uh, so that would be the model explaining wage. Here we could uh, estimate the misspecified model where wage is only regressed on education and ability is the omitted variable. So what will happen and what we found in the previous example is that the coefficient here would be biased on education. So here we have the, the coefficient that is unbiased 1.15 and this coefficient would actually uh, here be biased, it will be higher. We talked about it in the omitted uh, variable bias before. But another thing that we're finding here is that the standard error for this coefficient here has, uh, is lower than the standard error for the correctly specified model. So there's a trade-off between bias and variance. Uh, so although in the misspecified model we actually have bias in the coefficient, we have actually lower standard error. So, but overall, in general, we want to first get unbiased coefficients. So it's always good practice to not have omitted variables from your model. And finally, let's talk about homoscedasticity and heteroscedasticity. So homoscedasticity is when the variance of the error term is constant for each x and heteroscedasticity is when the variance of the error term is not constant for each x. We would use again the, ver the example on wages and we would run a regression of wage on education, experience and tenure. Okay, so this is the model that we ran. Um, and these are the same coefficients that we, re we, we received before. So we can calculate uh, the residuals by using predict, give it a name, you had for the residual, comma residual is the stata command here. And then we can use graph two way scatter uh, and then put the variables that we want to graph. So in this case, you had against, um, uh, against uh, experience. So if we are just running line by line this part of the code, uh, here's the first graph. So this would be a graph of say uh, how um, um, it seems like how heteroscedasticity would look like because you have as education increases, we you see like how we have the variance of these residuals is increasing. So this is an example of heteroscedasticity. And if we run this line here, uh, we would see more of homoscedasticity where no matter what uh, uh, range experience takes, uh, we see that the variance is uh, kind of more constant. And again, we have, we'll have formal tests for this, but this is just a visual interpretation of uh, homoscedasticity and heteroscedasticity. Um, alternatively, we can plot these residuals with uh, RVP plot, so you will get exactly the same uh, graphs as above. So you can plot uh, the variable, a comma y line zero, and that will be the command basically that is giving you the first graph that I showed you. Uh, so education against the residuals um, and uh, 
and and here we have the line at zero and then uh, this would be the line that we have and the graph that we have for um, experience so again this this shows more of a homoscedasticity uh, example that we have so with this said uh, i think that completes the multiple regression model in stata thanks for watching